Uh, welcome to the Penny Stamps Distinguished Speaker Series, everyone. My name is Christina Hamilton, the series director. Uh, best wishes to each and every one of you as we embark on a new year. Being at the top of the winter season, uh, the new Penny Stamp Series calendar of events is available in the lobby, uh, so pick one up on your way out and be sure not to miss a thing. Uh, you know, kudos to all of you for making it out on a dark, steely winter day, very gray more than cold. Just trust us, we'll be here through the winter to keep the lamp of inspiration burning for you, so do join us for more things to come. We are reconvening part two of our season theme, Thrive, uh, and we have a bona fide thriver with us here today to lead us off, director and puppet maker Robin Frohart. She is someone who makes the most from the least, even uh, our abandoned detritus, uh, as you will see, making magic of not only the mundane, uh, but making use of the unwanted. Uh, Today's event is co-presented co uh, with some fantastic co-presenters, and I want to thank the University of Michigan Museum of Art, the University Musical Society, and the U of M Graham Sustainability Institute, and the partnership of the U of M Arts Initiative. A big thank you. This is an extraordinary coming together uh, that makes it possible for Robin to be here with us today, uh, but also Robin is going to be with us into February because this event today kicks off the UMS No Safety Net 3.0 Festival, bringing us three weeks of provocative theater performance and installation art addressing issues relevant to our time. Opening with The Plastic Bag Store. Uh, this is an immersive performance installation created by today's guest, Robin Frohart. This opens next Tuesday, January 17th at the 777 Seven building. This is at Eisenhower here in, on Eisenhower here in Ann Arbor. There are time tickets required for entry. There are student price tickets available. I know for everybody here today, once you see Robin talk, you will not miss it. So you can get your tickets at the U of M Museum of Art website, uh, uma.umich.edu for tickets. And of course, more information and tickets to all of the No Safety Net lineup at ums.org. Uh, please do remember to silence your cell phones. Uh, and we will, Robin will stay for a Q&A today, directly following her talk here. You'll see we have Mike microphones at the ends of the two aisles, so when we get to that point in the uh, event, you can just take your place and line up at the microphones and she will answer away. Now, for a proper introduction of our guest, please welcome great partner to the series and great colleague, the director of the University of Michigan Museum of Art, Tina Olson. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you, Christina, and good evening. I'm so glad to be here with all of you tonight. It is my great pleasure to introduce Robin Frohart. She's with us for the next several weeks to share her installation and performance project, The Plastic Bag Store. Um, it'll be shared with the university and with Ann Arbor audiences. The presentation is a partnership between UMA, UMS, and the UM Graham Sustainability Institute with support as well from the University of Michigan Arts Initiative, Rachel Bendit and Mark Bernstein, Max Wicha and Sheila Crowley, Destination Ann Arbor, and the Eileen H. Forsyth Theater Endowment Fund. The Plastic Doors Bag Store premiered in New York as part of the Times Square Arts Program in 2020, and it has since toured to Adelaide, Australia, Los Angeles, Chicago, and Austin. It's a performance, a public art installation, and an immersive film experience that uses humor, craft, and a critical lens to question our culture of consumption and convenience, specifically the enduring effects of single-use plastic. I saw it a year ago in Chicago. I was just chatting with Robin backstage about it. About, it was exactly a year ago, in fact. And I wandered in, and I didn't really know what to expect, and I was really riveted. It's incredibly seductive. So it's filled with beautifully, exquisitely made cereal boxes and pastries and vegetables, all made of single-use plastic. 
and I think it's seductive in a way that all great stores are, when you go into a store and you just feel like, oh my gosh, there's so much beautiful stuff here. And I think that's part of what Robin is pointing out to us about how consumerism works on us. Everyone around me was delighted by it, kids, adults, families, so it's unique in my mind to the broad, the breadth of its appeal. But what then unfolds and kind of upends that seduction is this, is this installation, this, this performance, and Robin will tell you more about that, that is both very playful and very, very serious. And it left me thinking about the experience for months, about the lessons of, of what it was trying to tell us. You'll see what I mean when you go, and I really urge all of you to do that. Now a bit more about Robin. Robin is an award-winning artist living in Brooklyn, New York, known for her highly detailed constructions within narrative-based film, performance, puppetry, and sculpture. Her performance and puppetry-based work have been presented at St. Anne's Warehouse and in New York City, as well as national venues. Her theatrical work has earned her a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Creative Capital Award, a McDowell Colony Fellowship, and multiple Jem Henson Foundation grants, among others. Her play, The Pigeoning, hailed by the New York Times as a tender, fantastical symphony of the imagination, debuted in 2013 and has tr been translated into several languages. Her films have been official selections at the Telluride Film Festival, BAM, and elsewhere. We're so incredibly lucky to have her and the plastic bag store here in Ann Arbor. And now, I'm excited and happy to welcome Robert Frohart to the stage. Ready? Hi, I'm taller. I had to change the mic stand. <laughs> uh, hi, yeah, so um, ew, I'm Robin Frohart. <laughs> I'm an artist. Uh, I make films, I make installations, uh, I make puppets, often out of trash, though as my friend Chicken says, trash is just an opinion. Um, and, I, and I really like that. Um, I'm here with the plastic bag store. I'm going to talk a little bit uh, more about that later. Um, and we'll get into it. Uh, I, when I was asked to be a part of this lecture series, I was honored, excited, terrified. Uh, I've done a lot of talking about the plastic bag store in recent years, but I've never really been asked to talk about my work in general or at length or in front of so many people. <laughs> um, so I was trying to find a, a, a framework uh, for the talk because I didn't want to just go chronological. Um, I asked a friend to help me uh, characterize my work and, and he told me that I have a knack for taking a simple premise to an elaborate realization, which I think is just a nice way of saying that I can take a joke entirely too far, um, which is definitely true. <laughs> um, but after like going back over a decade's worth of work and looking at themes and through lines, I sort of landed on this magic from the mundane theme you see before you. I tried to make the most mundane slide I could possibly uh, muster with all my graphic design skills. <laughs> Um, often my work is, a, is pretty wacky, but it does often uh, deal with some kind of mundane uh, concepts or objects. So I'm going to frame this talk around five of the most mundane things I could possibly think of. Oh, th that's my mundane introduction. We just did that. Okay. <laughs> mundane objects number one, a cardboard box, an office safety binder, a plastic bag, and a parking lot. So if there's anything more exciting than going to a lecture, I'm sure it's going to a lecture on mundane objects. Uh, so we'll, we'll get started with um, a cardboard box. So I began working with cardboard in 2007 with the Cardboard Institute of Technology, which is actually just a, a ragtag group of artists. Um, we were in our 20s, we lived in the Bay Area, and we started making uh, in installations out of cardboard. We would build uh, cardboard cities. These are images from our first installation, Cardberg. Um, and we would allow the audience to explore them. They were highly detailed. They'd had their own news desks and traffic helicopters and um, backstories and hidden universes. And we would, would give the audience maps and they were set loose to, to explore uh, the environment. 
And then the, the Cardberg City evolved the next year into the Cardberg 500, which was, uh, we built a racetrack through the city and we took remote control cars and took their shells off and built our own cardboard cars around them and allowed the audience to uh, race, uh, race cardboard cars through Cardberg. That evolved into the Card. Superdome, super track, uh, which was a velodrome in which monster trucks were raced. <laughs> we also built several immersive installations at the Exploratorium Museum in San Francisco, which is a very fun art and science museum uh, there, very interactive. And so, you know, this was a very much collaborative effort. The Cardboard Institute of Technology was founded by um, Josh Short, a, a wonderful artist and friend, and I had many artists and friends that were a part of the group. Um, I, it's where I fell in love with the material of cardboard. Um, I studied painting in school and I definitely had a, a real desire to make things, but I never really knew what to make. And, um, and the idea of that you could just make anything out of anything, um, I just had no ideas. <laughs> I couldn't come up with anything. But all of a sudden when it was like you could only make race car stuff out of cardboard, it was just, the ideas were infinite. So I really loved like the limitation of that. And just being able to use just a knife, just cardboard, just hot glue, um, the, the materiality, the material is so versatile. It's structure, it's texture, it's everything. And but I also really learned how to like collaborate freely with this group of people. And we did it just for the love of doing it. We, you you know, scavenged the cardboard off the street. We recycled it afterwards and got money back and bought beer, and um, it was a simpler time. <laughs> um, uh, moving, uh, jumping ahead a little bit, I made my first cardboard short film in 2013, Fitz Cardboard Aldo. <laughs> which is a, an all cardboard tribute to Werner Herzog's uh, Fitz Caraldo. Uh, and if you don't know um, Fitz Caraldo, the film, Oh, we're gonna go here. This should start playing. Hmm. Bummer, dude. Anyway, it's a really amazing cardboard movie. It's on YouTube. You'll have to check it out. <laughs> um, but I, uh, Fitz, so Fitz Caraldo is, um, Oh yeah, it's remaining to be done. Okay, so Fitzcarraldo, the actual Fitzcarraldo, is a film made by Werner Herzog, and, Fitzcar and Fitzcarraldo is sort of a madman who wants to build an opera house in the jungle, and shenanigans ensue. Long story short, he has to move an entire boat over a mountain, which you can see here. Um, and it was notoriously like a very difficult um, movie to make. Um, because uh, Herzog had to actually move a uh, move, move a boat over the mountain to make the film. So the joke was, I would just make this incredibly difficult movie to make out of cardboard, just to show how easy it was. But the, the joke was on me because it was actually incredibly difficult to make this little short film. And I got really detailed, and it was a really great opportunity for me to see, uh, to meld puppetry and cardboard, and to learn how to use a camera, and to learn how to edit, uh, and, and to make this whole world come to life. Um, the movie the movie was so hard to make, Fitzcarraldo was, that Les Blank made a making of called The Burden of Dreams. Um, and so I had to make my own making of, which is The Corrugation of Dreams. <laughs> which is another movie here that would be playing here. Anyway, on YouTube, you can find it. Uh, <laughs> um, so jumping ahead, I made another, my other uh, cardboard film was uh, Bag. And this is actually a part of the plastic bag store narrative. And if you come, you will see it fits in, but it's also a, a short film that stands on its own. And it tracks the journey of one plastic bag um, from the present day into the far off future. And we follow it, you know, from the trash on a barge uh, to the dump and across time and different, and different landscapes, ultimately ending up in the ocean uh, and um, into the future where it's sort of a post-apocalyptic world. And this is where I really sort of dove into the depths of like the cardboard detailed film world and got to develop my own sort of way of making these special effects. Um, so this is me uh, hot gluing 
uh, a cardboard city, and what would be playing right next to here is what actually ends up being shot here, which was like a, a helicopter shot um, of this panoramic city view. And that was the one thing I learned I could do. I could mess with scale and, and change things, um, build things small, build things big, and, and create all these like lo-fi special effects. I was a big fan of Michel Gondry. I grew up watching all of his music videos in the 90s and love all these practical effects, which I got to uh, work out on my own. And this is another example of, uh, card of uh, my assistant at the time, Tyler Gunther, who is now in our show here, and is also greedy peasant, if you've ever been on TikTok. Um, and so I, I, would have car I would have Tyler moving these, uh, moving these clouds vertically, and it would appear like the bag was falling next to it. Um, and then also this video would show a fan blowing on a piece of mylar uh, to create a, a rippling water effect uh, next to, uh, to make this underwater effect really happen underwater. All this is really great when there's movies coming. You just gotta come to the plastic bag store. You gotta trust me. <laughs> um, oh, look at that. Oh, look at that. So here we have like a, a fish puppet moving and then of course it's just Tyler on a skateboard. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's, let's check and see if the other ones work. Mm, no, okay. Uh, also this one is also a video and is this one. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I really love this process of making the cardboard movies because it's a very self-contained. I can like think of an idea and make it in my studio and shoot it in the camera and then edit it. Um, and it's a sort of instant gratification uh, in, in how to make these films. Okay, moving on to mundane item number two, an office safety binder. Uh, so The Pigeoning was my first full-length play, all done in puppets, and it is the story of Frank, who is an office safety enthusiast, who um, is a diligent student of his office safety training manual, he loves order, loves cleanliness. Uh, he begins to think that the pigeons in the park are um, plotting against him because they're always like complicating his life and causing a mess. And so he launches an investigation into a, a pigeon conspiracy um, that is led only by his office safety training manual. Um, that's the only dialogue in the whole show is we, as he's reading, we can hear what the office safety training manual is saying and it's giving him instructions on how to investigate an interspecies conspiracy. <laughs> Uh, and so we actually made our own um, office safety tr training videos, which would also be playing here. <laughs> we made um, our own office safety training videos that we would play at the beginning of the show, and the audience would come, come in and sit on their seats, and there would be their own office safety manuals, and we would give them like their own office safety orientation training before we would start the puppet show. And that would allow them to sort of be in Frank's mindset. Um, I know. Is it possible? <laughs> it says builds remaining, which makes me think that it, it's not there. Does that make sense? So that should be a video that would play. That's when they won't play it, it says builds remaining. Okay, I, I don't know. Sorry. Okay. More, yeah, okay, analog better than digital maybe. Okay. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about this. Uh, yeah, maybe if there is someone in the tech world that knows how to make that happen, that would be awesome. <laughs> um, but while Mel, maybe you're figuring that out, I'm just gonna keep talking. Um, this style of puppetry that we use, um, we call it Boon Raku style puppetry. And what it is, is it's, well, Boon Raku is a traditional Japanese form of puppetry, basically. And we say Boon Raku style because we've really bastardized it quite a bit. Um, and basically it's three puppeteers working together together to animate one figure. And uh, so there's one person operating Frank's head and his right arm, and one person operating his torso and his left arm, and then a third person operating his feet. And 
it takes an incredible amount of collaboration um, to make to make Frank come alive. But I'm really into this form of puppetry because instead of like a marionettist who is like a, a technician having to move strings in a very specific way, um, any, any gesture that a performer can do is, is, is translated directly in, into, the, into, the puppet's, into the puppet's body. So Frank can make very realistic gestures um, and he can do almost anything that a human can do. Oh, all right, I'll just keep chatting about it. Um, I got into puppetry because uh, I dropped out of college and I got a job at a bar in San Francisco called the Odeon and it was a dive bar and the, it was a place for odd and unlikely entertainment. So the rules were no bands, no DJs, but anything else. <laughs> so we had burlesque shows, we had puppet shows, we had all kinds of weird stuff. And one day a puppet show came through town, it was Jawbone Puppet Theater, I remember they were from Seattle, and they did a Charles Bukowski story um, about necrophilia all done in puppets. And I, I was just completely blown away because I, I couldn't believe, it was like an animated painting. Um, and I didn't really think of puppets as something that could be good storytelling for, for grown-ups, um, but it was incredibly moving. Um, and, and so that's sorry, where I fell in love with the form. And it's also like, you know, it's a combination of all of the art forms coming together for it to be successful. It has to be, I have to paint something, I have to sculpt something, I have to write something, I have to perform something. Um, and so all of those forms have to come together for it to, to work. Um, and when it does, it's, it's awesome. Um, and so one of the amazing things about the pigeoning was I got to work with an incredible group of friends and artists, and we sort of learned this form together. We were all performers and had done some puppetry, but we really got to master um, the work together and tour it around the world, and um, they all are incredible artists who make their own work now, um, and some of them are still involved with the plastic bag store today and that was a great gift. But we did get to tour around all over the place. And here's a picture of us. We went to, we went uh, several places in the Northeast, but we also went to Germany twice. They loved it because they love safety and cleanliness over there. <laughs> Super, they really related to Frank's journey. <laughs> uh, we went to Singapore. Um, we went to Turkey and we went to uh, Egypt. This is Frank with some puppets in Singapore and then also Frank with some children in Cairo. The kids really loved him there. I'm not sure if they really understood my nuanced take on 1980s American office safety culture, but they did really like Frank. <laughs> um, there were a couple spin-off projects that I should mention kind of related to the pigeoning. Uh, Little Amal, I don't know if you know, have ever heard of Little Amal, but she's a giant puppet uh, that was created um, by a, a Palestinian artist, and she is a Syrian refugee, that's her character, and she has, uh, they have been traveling with her across Europe, and she came to New York and did several events around town, and uh, I was asked to put together a parade of pigeons across the Brooklyn Bridge. So we choreographed this big uh, performance. We had 100, 100 pigeons um, traveling across the Brooklyn Bridge, and we, we encircled her and did a little scene, and it was quite, quite beautiful. Uh, another spin-off of the, of from Frank's story is Frank has a dream at one point and the trash explodes into a trash monster because you know he hates the trash um, and so I, I had built this small inflatable trash monster which later inspired uh, uh, the dumpster monster which I'm going to try to find a better picture of. Do you think you have an idea? Yeah. Huh. I saw it. Did you see it moving? Did you see it? Let's try again. <laughs> All right, no luck. <sighs> Boo. One more. Nope. All right. Hey, hey, hey. Life's complicated, you guys. <laughs> uh, anyway, the dumpster monster, the dumpster looks just like a regular dumpster, but it explodes into a 10 foot tall dumpster monster, and we've taken him to parties and terrified people on the street um, and we normally like hand out uh, fly puppets on sticks and rats and we have remote control cockroaches and it's really gross and very fun. 
Um, so moving on to a mundane item, number three, a plastic bag. Um, so the plastic bag store, it, it's, an, it's a, an immersive gro grocery store. Um, it's a fake grocery store that exists inside of a, of a real storefront. And I got the idea from watching someone bag and double bag and triple bag all of my groceries that were already bags inside of boxes inside of bags. And I was like, this is fucking stupid. We should make a grocery store that just sells packaging to sort of highlight the ridiculousness of how much trash we're using. Oh, okay. <laughs> And so this was an idea I had a very long time ago, and it was kind of a joke idea and things, you know, a dream, I would, or a funny thing I would say to make my friends laugh, and it was actually a part of a, a, a larger idea. I wanted to make an entire shopping center full of wacky stores because I come from Colorado Springs, Colorado. I don't hear any woo-hooing, and that is correct. <laughs> um, it looks like this, <laughs> as does everywhere, really. Um, but I, I grew up in, in these environments, and uh, you know, they're just, it, it's so depressing, and they really suck the life out of you, and I, I'm like, I get dehydrated just looking at these places. And so I wanted to make a, a, a shopping center that was full of wild stores where you could go and have like a, a life-affirming experience, a rehydrating experience, and, and the plastic bag store was actually just gonna be one of those stores. Um, and the, the shopping center was going to be called Something of Value, and the main store was going to be Value Mart, and Value Mart was going to be a place where you could take all of your uh, um, like items that had lost their value because they were just bullshit and they broke, like a Justin Bieber singing toothbrush that no longer worked, and you could take this to Value Mart and you could exchange it for something whose value never changed, like a, a wooden spoon or a crowbar or something. So, so the joke plastic bag store was just always like a part of this idea, but I, I realized I was never gonna be able to pull off this whole shopping center idea. And so I thought maybe I could just do the plastic bag store and I could put it in New York and I could put it in Times Square and maybe people would encounter it by accident um, and, and be surprised and horrified. <laughs> Um, so I started designing uh, some, of the, some of the products that would go inside. So this is like the fruits and vegetables. I was collecting plastic bags from my building, from my neighbors on the street, pulling them out of trash. Um, and so this is like an example of what the meat looks like. Um, I also started designing my own packaging that were satirical takes on brands that we know. <laughs> so. I would design these in, in collaboration uh, with Tyler, again, actually, and we would, uh, would collect plastic trash and then stuff the boxes full of them. And everything is plastic bags, so everything's a joke on plastic bags. So we've Plastazona tea, Bags Loco, Fa bags. Um, and so that originally the idea was just this elaborate one-liner of a project. Um, but after working on the pigeoning and, and telling all these, uh, telling this really, having this really narrative puppet performance, I really wanted to write something that, that worked, that fit inside the plastic bag store that was related to it. Um, and the discovery of this item was a really pivotal point in my life. <laughs> uh, the first time I saw this, I just laughed out loud. That is the dumbest thing I have ever seen in my life. Um, Oh, God. <laughs> um, and so it just occurred to me, like, how ridiculous this is and how permanent it's going to be and how short of amount of time that we're going to use it. Um, and I also read in this process of, of researching that, you know, all the plastic that's ever been made still exists. The plastic does not decompose, right? It breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces, but it doesn't go away. And I was like, oh my God, like a straw that I used in a Happy Meal as a child in the 80s is still somewhere. The first tampon applicator I ever used is somewhere right now. And that was just like mind-blowing experience. And uh, I, I started to imagine, what is it gonna be like for people in the future that are um, excavating all of this stuff, especially this thing? How are they gonna know what it is? They might get it totally wrong and might misinterpret the function of all of these things. And that is a funny idea for a puppet show. <laughs> so uh, I started writing the narrative that fits inside the plastic bag store. And I conceived of this character in the future. Uh, in a far off frozen future, uh, who discovers a bag of plastic trash um, and 
a receipt, uh, an old CVS receipt, and the only words he can make out are uh, most valued customer. And so he interprets that these items must have belonged to the most valued practitioner of the ancient customs and were therefore incredibly important. And he completely gets it wrong what all of these things actually are. So then I started to wonder in my writing process, well, who's, whose items were these? Um, you know, he ends up making a museum to the most valued customer. So I was like, oh, maybe they belonged to someone who worked in a museum in our time. And that's how I came up with Helen, who lives in the present day, and she's a custodian at a museum and a great lover of the antiquities of the past. Um, and then I, you know, she loves all this ancient Greek pottery because I, I, you know, started to think about the plastic water bottles are the Greek vases of our era, right? So I was looking at this black figure uh, Greek pottery and realized it kind of looks like shadow puppets. So I wrote an act that's the 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 ancient past, which is act one. And in, in my ancient past fable, all done in shadow puppets, uh, Thaddeus invents a single use disposable Greek vase. <laughs> and um, shenanigans ensue. Uh, and so uh, part of the, these are a lot of spoiler alerts for the plastic bags, but we still gotta come, it's still gonna be cool, I promise. Uh, but, so this is a, a, an exhibit from the Museum of the Most Valued Customer, um, the Sacred Chalice from the exclusive Club Chill, uh, <laughs> where all of our items are sort of misinterpreted and, 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 and put on pedestals. And so, uh, and there, in, you know, here's some more examples of that. <laughs> Um, and these are uh, compasses here on the right and letter carriers on the left. That will make more sense when you see the show. Uh, and so I, I really like got excited about this idea of plastic as artifact. And while I was writing the show, I had a fellowship at the University of North Carolina where I was uh, challenged to interact with departments that don't normally work uh, with the arts. And so I got to work with archeologists, real archeologists on, on this plastic archeology span idea. And this is actually their stuff. Um, and they were super excited because they're always trying to teach their students to see their own time through an archeological lens. But also they do a, a lot of mandated archeological surveys of an area if they're gonna build a highway or an airport or something. And anything over 50 years old, they have to categorize and classify as an artifact. And uh, about 50 years ago is when all this disposable plastic started coming into our lives. So they are already having to sort of deal with plastic as artifact, but they don't necessarily have the same systems in place, the way, like the way they can think of ceramics and categorize and classify ceramics. Um, there's all these different ways to do that. They don't necessarily have that for, for plastic yet, and so they're at the beginning of that. And so we thought of, we were, you know, we had to collaborate in some way for this fellowship and, you know, I, we were thinking of what to do and, and one of the archeologists told me that, you know, oftentimes they use art to identify objects. So they find like a broken handle from a certain kind of vase, they don't know what it is, they'll reference old paintings to be like, oh, that was the handle of so-and-so. So I was like, well, there's a way we can use art to, tell future archeologists um, what to do or, 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 or what some of these objects are. Um, and so well, we actually, we started an Instagram account called Plastic Archeology span in which we just started categorizing and classifying and, and, and just, just taking pictures of it and then just explaining what all of these things are. Um, and there was actually great humor in that because these things are so funny and stupid. <laughs> um, but if you, in the future, if you just found like that little pizza table thing, you might have no idea what it is, right? And so we're like, oh, we'll, 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 make, we'll explain what all these things are for future archeologists that obviously won't have Instagram. It's an art project, it's just, you know. Uh, but anyway, yeah. Anyway, so just describing what that is, the pizza tables, there's inherent humor in all of it. So uh, it took me a while uh, to, to put all this together, this whole grocery store, this whole immersive puppet show in three acts that fits inside. The grocery store transforms into a theater and there's hidden spaces. Um, and I worked on it for many years and in 2020 I teamed up with uh, the Times Square Art Alliance um, and we got a storefront right in the heart of Times Square, which was my dream in the beginning. And uh, we got all the people in place, we got all the things, the thing, da, 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 da. we were all ready to open uh, on March uh, 15th, 2020. 
Yeah. That was worse than when the videos didn't work. <laughs> um, and uh, so we just closed, uh, we, had to, we did one dress rehearsal and then we had to close the doors and, you know, uh, uh, quarantine and, and we didn't really know what the future was and, and the store sat there in Times Square in a post-apocalyptic, weird, uh, abandoned grocery store, which is very ironic because in the plastic bag store, someone finds a post-apocalyptic abandoned grocery store, <laughs> but we had our own. Um, it sat there for, for, for several months, but in, um, later on in August, we were able to get some funding from, is this one gonna work? No, no, don't. Um, from UCLA to turn some of the puppetry elements into a film. And so we, we, we filmed some of the elements and, and it turned out even more better than the live show and it really tells this incredibly detailed story. I'm able to focus people's um, vision on all the, all the details of the story. And so we've now put the film back into the installation and it's now it's like this weird immersive film thing that I never would have imagined. I never could have thought of all at once. It was kind of this whole journey that, that took me to, to where it is now and what you'll see when you come. And the videos will work there, I promise. Chad's, Chad's on it, okay. So, so we, we did the plastic bag store in LA, New York, uh, Adelaide, Chicago, um, and, and everywhere we go, we, we make a local product too, so we're like constantly adding to the collection. You know, when we were in Australia, we made um, Bagamite, uh, and so uh, Michigan, uh, <laughs> that's what you're getting. <laughs> um, for all you bagalos out there. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, another thing that we've done with the Plastic Bag Store is we have um, <clears throat> worked with local activists or politicians or advocacy groups to help sort of amplify some of the work that's going into changing a policy, uh, instituting plastic bag bans. We opened in New York the, the day that the plastic bag ban went into effect. Um, when we were in Australia, they had a, a plastic cutlery ban that had just started. And so it's really nice to, when we can help amplify activists' message because we don't have the time to do that kind of work. Uh, you know, I have, and they don't have time to make a grocery store. So it's great we can like team up and help amplify each other's messages that way. And it's been really successful. But I did kind of want to talk a little bit about art and activism, and I made this super lame slide on purpose. Um, <laughs> uh, because, uh, let's see here. <laughs> I, I feel like I'm often asked about like, what's the role of, the, of art and activism? And I feel like that feels like a generic question. And it feels like this slide feels. Um, and I feel like people want to hear that artists have an obligation to be activists or to make art about something. And I just want to push back on that just a little bit. Um, I don't think artists have an obligation to make art about anything. Um, I think it's difficult or it's interesting now that a lot of work that gets funded is about social issues or political issues or environmental issues. That's great. Not saying that's, that's awesome. That's what I do. That's cool. <laughs> but I do think there needs to be space for art that's just totally weird and doesn't make any sense. And if you are an artist out there, I hope you give yourself the freedom to just make some weird ass shit and not feel responsible to take on all the problems of the world. <laughs> <laughs> I have to like, I'm just gonna skip to the next slide so I'm not photographed in front of that. Uh. <laughs> yeah. I think we have a plan for the video. Okay. If you want it, do you, if you want it, if it would take us a minute, we're gonna switch out the computer and I think we have the backup disc where they're still on there. I think maybe they oh, really? edited at the beginning. Give, give me just one second. Out. Okay. I'll wrap this section up. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you for clapping for that because I have wanted to say that for a long time. <laughs> uh, I feel like I'm often um, asked to, uh, uh, like ha have answers, um, you know, I think it's complicated. 
people feel obligated to have a message, but I've, I've sort of just like followed my instinct on what I found interesting um, or curious. You know, I was annoyed by the plastic bullshit and I was curious about the longevity and what it would be like to find plastic in the future. And, and that sort of investigation led me to the plastic bag store. I didn't necessarily feel like I have a message and this is how I'm gonna communicate it, you know? Um, I, I just wanted it to stand alone as a, as a strong work of art and not necessarily be a diatribe about one single issue. I also, you know, it's not chock full of statistics like millions and billions of bags. It's not, um, oh, I lost my thing. Oh, anyway, I, I, it's a one woman show now. We don't need it. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, all right, uh, <laughs> I didn't want to be a diatribe. I'm also not interested in shaming people for their plastic use. I think it's really complicated. Like, I, I'm not pl plastic free. I don't really claim to be. I definitely try to do my best. There are people who are plastic free and they have blogs about it and that's their job, you know? <laughs> like the world is it's a very difficult to live in, in in that way. It's also an equity issue, you know? Like these fancy water bottles and canvas bags, like as wonderful as they are, they're, you know, that's not a available to everybody. A lot of people's only shopping option is the dollar store, and the cheapest option is often the plasticiest option. And I have no interest in policing people's behavior because I don't like plastic, but I also don't like cops. And, and, <laughs> And I, and I also, you know, I don't, I don't want people to, to I, I, like, I've downered people with images of, of sea turtles choking on plastic bags. I'm trying to find some, like, humor and levity and a way into this that's, that's a little bit more different. Um, and I feel like often I'm also asked to have some sort of, like, a hopeful message, and I have to say that I am equally balanced of hope and despair at all times. <laughs> Um, and, I, and I certainly, I have no answers. I'm told that we live here. Um, so I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> and um, I make puppet shows. And I'm much more into making shit up than figuring stuff out. So I don't have all the answers. <laughs> I'm, I'm just gonna keep rolling. Um, okay, so next mundane object is a parking lot. Um, so uh, this is a, a project that's currently in the works, so I normally don't share things as unfinished, but I'm just gonna show you some images. Um, I've lived across the street from uh, this Home Depot parking lot for about 14 years in Brooklyn, New York. And uh, this is like a really weird, warbly Google Earth version vision of it. <laughs> But it's a very, uh, it's a very insane Home Depot parking lot. Uh, there's all different kinds of cultures and people and activity, um, and I've, I can see it all from my fire escape, and I've been watching it for many years, and I've always wanted to make a documentary about it. And, and so I've been recreating the parking lot in my studio out of cardboard. Um, with the cars and the lights and recreating um, other buildings that surround the parking lot. Uh, this is the lady that sells tamales on the corner. I've been create, recreating her uh, stuff. And there's a school on the other side of the parking lot. This is my cardboard Google Earth. <laughs> <clears throat> And so what started as a documentary, well, I start, that was my goal, I wanted to make a documentary, and then as I like, you know, barely got started, I realized I'm not a journalist at all, I'm an artist, and I, I don't wanna be held to any sort of journalistic integrity. Uh, like I said, I'm more into making shit up. Uh, and so I, I wrote an essay about the parking lot, um, and it ended up morphing into a story about this puddle that's been growing on the roof of the mirror and glass door next to the parking lot. It's slowly taking over the building. Um, and I, it ends up meandering and, and talking about parking lots in general and what it feels like to come from shopping center culture and growing up in a non-place and how that always kind of makes me feel um, a little bit like embarrassed or shame in a forest. Uh, which is which is an odd feeling. And so this, this film will be a little bit more um, meditative this is a cool video, trust me. Uh, <laughs> and then this is me recreating that thing in cardboard. <laughs> um, but <laughs> this is my mundane conclusion. And then they said maybe that some of the videos will be able to be shown, but we'll see, we'll see how it goes for time. Um, but this idea of like the, the built world and the natural world, the parking lots and the forest, um, this is sort of a theme that's actually 
in a lot of my work I'm finding now that I went back and made this lecture. <laughs> and, and it also like relates to this, um, the mundane objects that we've discussed. A lot of my work has floods in it. Almost every show has a flood. Didn't really notice until I made this lecture. But I think it's a, a good metaphor for where the man-made world and the, and the built world um, collide. And I think the idea that I'm trying to get at or trying to explore with this man-made world, natural world, like intersection, is a little bit bigger than man versus nature, nature versus man. Um, because, you know, even the man-made world is, is nature. It's all a part of the same thing. We're all here. The universe uh, contains every nonsense man-made object, as well as every beautiful natural object. You know, we didn't like come into the world, we came out of it. This is all a part of the same thing, you know. You know, uh, oh, this is my flood image. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> Ross Dress for Less is made of the same stardust as you or I, you know. It's all, it's all contained in the same thing. You know, this is in here. Like this is in here, <laughs> blows my mind. <laughs> but so is like Machu Picchu and Pokemon and electric eels and Taylor Swift and every tampon applicator she ever used. You know, it's all just like swirling around in like this big whatever the hell this is. And so, um, you know, actually there's probably really not anything very mundane at all. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes. Folks, we think that we have actually sorted out the video issue. So if you hold on for just a quick moment, we're gonna see if this works. This one. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Oh, so this, this is uh, scenes from uh, Fitz Cardboard Alder, the first cardboard film that I made. Um, and this, you know, I was talking about when this was happening is, uh, you know, trying to like meld the puppetry and the cardboard world together. And I, I didn't know how to edit a video. I didn't know how to use a camera and I just kind of figured it out. And I, and I played these um, at a puppet festival in New York as just like an interstitial thing in between shows, and then I put them on the internet, and um, the Telluride Film Festival contacted me and asked if, if they could show them, which is like, I was honored, but they're, you know, big Herzog fans there, so they were super into it. Um, and I'm really glad they were, because I actually stole the audio directly from The Burden of Dreams. <laughs> uh, these, are, these are scenes from the making of The Burden of Dreams, uh, and in this, video, which you can watch on YouTube. Um, <clears throat> Herzog, in his, in The Burden of Dreams, he's uh, talking about, you know, he's been, he's been struggling in the desert, trying to get this, like, mountain, this boat over the mountain. There's me in the same struggle. <laughs> um, and, and he's fighting against uh, nature and, and everything. He's kind of losing his mind. Um, and so, yeah, I stole that audio directly out of the film. And fortunately, Les Blank's children really liked them and they ended up not suing me. Uh, and, oh, this is me battling nature. That's, yeah. <laughs> oh, and there's my car cardboard, cardboard Werner Herzog. <laughs> um, so, I can show you now. Oh, here is sort of like side by side, uh, you know, me creating this cardboard city and then like what it looks like in the film with the flyover, the helicopter view. And then finally Tyler's beautiful falling plastic bag with the clouds whizzing past. <laughs> and then our fan <laughs> rigged up blowing on some mylar, creating an underwater effect. And, and this is what it looks like in the camera. And I use this really cheap lens called a lens baby that's very flexible to sort of get this underwater effect. Oh, we saw the fish. Uh, oh, and then I'm gonna skip ahead to the pigeon stuff real quick. Oh. 
oh, this was a little bit of the office safety training videos that we made. This is the, ca <laughs> the cast of the pigeoning <laughs> um, teaching us that safety at your job is... <laughs> And we would show these beforehand. Uh, this is Admiral Gray, the actress uh, who is and performer and musician who's also in the plastic bag store. Um, and so we would show these to the audience before they saw the puppet show so that they understood all of the important rules of office safety. Oh, and so this is, uh, this is sort of an example. This is a scene from The Pigeoning. Um, and, I, and I was talking a little bit about this style of puppetry and the way that we can uh, work together. So it's like you know, a different person on his right arm and his left arm. And so we all have to coordinate uh, and work together. Um, and I just, I just love working this way. It's the same style of puppetry in, in the plastic bag store as well. And these characters just really come to life and because it's not one of us as a performer playing a character, it's all of us. So it seems yeah, like a whole real person, you know? And another thing I really love about um, puppetry is storytelling. It's just like puppets are already metaphors, you know? They, they just like represent people, so they're great tools for storytelling. Um, and they're also very, like, <laughs> they're also real. Like when a puppet walks on stage, you're, you know, when an actor walks on stage, you're like evaluating what you think of the actor. Is he doing a good job? Is he attractive? Like, would you have made that choice? Like you're evaluating them as a human, but, but Frank is just Frank, you know? You can't judge him, he just, he just is, yeah. And so at this point in the pigeoning, uh, Frank, you know, has, has, is deep into his investigation and uh, he, he can't figure out what the birds are up to. He knows they're up to something, um, but he makes this discovery that actually the birds are do up to something. They're trying to warn him about an upcoming flood. And the flood does come and Frank builds a raft out of his uh, items he founds or finds around the office. <clears throat> And is, and is ultimately saved by the pigeons. And in the end, he is sort of filthy and disheveled in the park, but he's friends with the birds instead of fighting against them. And so to me, it's sort of a, a story about letting go of, of safety and control in, in the face of the end of the world and, and being able to, to listen to nature and what, what it's trying to tell us. And so even though he lives in chaos and filth, uh, he's much happier. <laughs> I think this is a, oh, this is a video of little Lamal with, with some of her flocks of pigeons. And we had a hundred volunteers come and operate these birds. And we got to cross the Brooklyn Bridge. Oh, and then of course the dumpster monster. Flies, flies on sticks, flies on sticks. Oh, there it goes. <laughs> So he's actually just a giant inflatable, uh, and inside is one of those fans for the like car dealership guys, you know? <laughs> Very fun to surprise people with on the street. <laughs> Oh, this is him getting beat up um, at a party called Bike Kill. And your homework is to Google Bike Kill. <laughs> um, do I have any other videos? Oh, um, yeah. Oh, this is a little clip of us um, when we went back into the store during the pandemic and started filming the puppet show. This is the photographer, Rob uh, Kolodny, filming, and this is, this is the end result of kind of what it looks like. So I was really able to f focus the audience on certain details, and we thought of so many details into this show and so many like hidden jokes. And so it was really a gift to be able to finally put it on film and to be able to share it. We also, besides traveling with the installation, 
<clears throat> the way we do at the immersive experience, which is not to be missed. Uh, we also show an edited version of the film uh, at film festivals, um, and we just showed it at a film festival in India, actually, um, and it'll be at a, another environmental film festival in, in D.C. in March, uh, and, and, and other s school groups have seen it as well. Uh, oh, I think I just have one more thing, art, yada, 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 you don't have a cardboard brush for me. Oh, um, when I was talking about making this film and, and uh, making the, uh, this thing that I'm working on, I was just at a residency in New Hampshire in the, in the winter, and I, and I was walking through the woods and was watching the way the light comes through the trees like this, and then I went back to my studio um, and tried to recreate it <laughs> with sticks and a lamp. Um, yeah, I think that's it for the videos. I'm so glad I got to show them. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. okay, so so glad you. Okay. Here's this. Okay. There's a Q&A. Okay. Well, I'm so glad we worked that out, too. Those were gorgeous. Um, we will have a Q&A now, so if folks want to come down to the two microphones, uh, we still have time. You can ask Robin some questions. Would this video play forever behind you? Or yeah, yeah we, we, could, we can just stop it. I think there's a, there was a penny stamps one at the end. That they could, oh, but maybe not. Oh, no, not that one. Yeah. The end, it works. All okay. right. Okay. Woo! Okay, you've already got people at the microphones. You might maybe take a moment and then I'm going to bring up more of the house light. Okay. And actually, you need stage. No, you have stage light. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah, take a drink. Should I just go ahead and start now? Okay. okay, I'm just going to go ahead and start. I know a lot of you all have to leave, but since i got people lined up, uh, I'll take some questions. Yeah, and for folks leaving, please do so as quietly as you can so we can hear up here. Oh, can we get this mic on right here? I'm a mic. Oh, no, oh, I do. Okay. Hi. Um, oh, this was so much better formed in my head. Um, oh, same with that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just, uh, I wanted to ask about, like, I've just been thinking a lot about how, like, art is, like, it's me, I'm too close. It's you? Okay. Um, how art is like collaborative at its best, I think, and this obviously is. So I don't know, like what do you have to say about that and like how do you do that well? Uh, yeah, she asked like, uh, how to do collaboration well. And I, I, I think if I could go back and do my lecture again, I would have mentioned even more about my collaborators because this is an incredibly collaborative process. Um, and I have worked with some of the same people for a very long time, and I'm incredibly grateful that they still want to be a part of that. <laughs> um, I also tend to pick people that I just want to spend time with and who get my jokes. Um, I definitely couldn't have done any of that on my own, obviously. Um, so I do think collaboration is incredibly important. And it also like helps you get your ego out of the game a little bit too, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but I do also have to have things, like the, that's kind of where the cardboard movies come in is that that's something I can do all on my own. And that, that's like a, a nice release valve <laughs> at least. But, but being able to collaborate and travel the world with my friends is like, it's the shit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. thank you. Yeah. Howdy. Hi. Um, I was wondering, you're talking about uh, collecting various like groups of different colors of like plastic bags and all this other detritus. How do you like go about owning a studio with all and organize all of these like disparate pieces of trash? Uh, because I've tried that before and I'm trying it right now and it's like very difficult to like keep things organized. And, oh my like, gosh, it's so difficult. <laughs> when I first started, I was like, well, I'm gonna make a whole grocery store. I'll just start, everybody save your trash and I'll come pick it up and then I'll just store it in my room. And then it just was like chaos, you know? Um, and so I had to be a little bit more selective about what I 
picked, because at first I was like, oh, it's a grocery store, it's everything, so I have to save everything. So I had to be like, okay, I'm only gonna save these specific kinds of berry containers or something like that. Um, but yeah, I had to do a lot of cleaning. You know, I lived in my studio for at the beginning of this process, um, so my bedroom was like a recycling center. <laughs> um, but I guess it depends on like what kind of stuff that you're trying to find. And trying to find a good source of it is also very challenging. Um, so I, I would love to give you more detailed advice. You should Instagram me and maybe I can help you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Um, I've done a lot of work with like stop motion, um, like paper stop motion and your work like kind of reminded me of that. Have, have you ever done any stop motion? Oh yeah, I actually was, was gonna say that. So those cardboard films, I call them animations because it's the easiest way for people to understand what they are. When I say cardboard animation, it's easier than saying cardboard puppetry, but technically that's just puppetry, right? Because I'm, I'm not stop motion animating it. I have tried stop motion animation and I am not patient enough. <laughs> uh, I, it's, I mean, I admire you for doing that and I admire the form so much. Um, but for me, be, I guess because I was already a puppet person, um, I have often found it much easier for me to be like, like pulling um, something with a string off the camera or like wiggling something than to be more precise with, with each frame. But I absolutely love stop motion and I wish I could do more of it and I, I definitely admire you for taking it on. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Um, so as an artist who starts, who has like started off in painting as you did um, and is trying to figure out where she wants to go with like her stuff, how do you not get stuck in that process of like trying to figure out where you wanna kind of dwell off into mediums and stuff? Yeah, I think I gave myself a lot of freedom, you know, to try different things. Uh, and I wanted to learn how to do like everything, everything I started doing, I didn't know how to do to, in the beginning. So I was never like, oh, well, I can't build that. I don't know how to use hand tools, you know? <laughs> like I was just like, well, I'll just figure out how to do that. So, and, and like well, the same with the film, you know? Um, and so giving myself permission to like try new things and I would say just like get as many skills as you possibly can, learn Photoshop, go in the wood shop, like, you know, try to try to just learn as many things as you possibly can so that when, um, you know, uh, when, when, you're, when you have an idea, um, you have the skills to do it. But I will say this, that none of my ideas came to me like, here's an idea, the plastic bag store, and it'll be like that, you know, it's like, it, it often starts with like the smallest seed that is a nothing of an idea, where I'm like this, like the pigeoning was like, I do a, did a sketch of a pigeon wearing a diving bell, and I was like, is this a thing, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I just kind of kept going and kept pushing. I was like, well, maybe it's a story of this, well, maybe that, and it's like, so kind of never being done, and, and so you might not think that you have an idea, or you might not know, but you do. You just have to like keep watering that seed, even if it, you think it's nothing. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, so firstly, I wanted to say, I find your art very inspiring uh, for someone that kind of I'm not really sure what I want to do either, so to just hear you, your sort of process and exploring that, I found that very helpful, so thank you. But I was wondering, what are your, like, um, online handles and stuff? Oh, yeah, yeah, I, uh, Instagram, I'm at Robin Frohart. Okay, I yeah. think so, and then on, on YouTube, is it the same thing, uh, or? Yeah, if you, uh, yeah, I'm not really good at YouTube, uh, so, but if you, if you look up Robin for, or if it's Cardboard Aldo, you'll find those videos, for okay. sure. Cool, yeah. I just wanted to find them again, yeah, thank yeah, you yeah. so much. <laughs> Another note, just as what it was the previous artist who asked, like, I didn't make any of the, anything that you saw here, I mean, the Cardboard Institute of Technology stuff, I, that, I was 28 when I started doing that. I didn't make the pigeoning until I was 33 or something. I ha when I was in my early 20s, most of my 20s, I was just like, I wanna do stuff, I don't know what. I had a lot of energy. So I worked for other artists and I found that incredibly helpful. Uh, I became an artist assistant and, and, and saw how other people did it and I spent years doing that. And so that's another answer to that question. Hi, 
Hi, um, I had a question about if you had any um, other characters before Frank, and also kind of a two-parter. Did you do any of the puppeteering? Like, which, if you did, what part of the body were you? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I have done, I'm not in those videos. When I direct and make that stuff, I kind of have to be on the outside to see what it looks like. Because when you're in it, you don't really know if it looks good or not. You really need an outside eye. Um, but I have jumped in, into the role several times. Um, and as far as puppets before Frank, yes. It, when I lived in San Francisco, I've, uh, some friends and I had a little puppet troupe called the Apocalypse Puppet Theater. And we made a few uh, shadow puppet shows. Um, and yeah, they were all pretty silly. But we would just do them like at parties or bars or whatever. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Robin, I have an idea for you to explore. Okay. That trash receptacle had waste management. That's an oxymoron. <laughs> yeah, Mix, m mismanagement. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and exploring the whole waste, which we're going to be unable to bury enough of it. In oh the yeah, it's already a total. It's already totally mismanaged and. Um, and it, I, I agree, yeah. We're, we're already inundated. It's too much for me to think about sometimes. And I think sometimes I feel, uh, especially back to the artist who asked about collecting plastic, um, I started to feel like I was responsible for every piece of plastic that came across my path. And if I didn't find a, a use for it in the art, that it was like my own personal failing. <laughs> um, and that started to feel very overwhelming about like, oh, I make, I recycle plastic. So then I, everything I touched or someone near me, I felt responsible for. And I've since let that go just a little bit. <laughs> Great yeah. show. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you. I just want to say thank you. I don't have a yeah. question. I just really appreciate you like being real and keeping it like honest about like you can make art about anything. And I feel like I've been struggling with that lately and like taking everything so seriously. I just yeah. kind of need to dial that back and like let myself create. So yeah. I just wanted to thank you. Oh really yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah, get weird. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, so I was wondering, what would you say to someone that wants to get into puppetry, wants to get into filmmaking? Like, what are some tips that you give, or like, how did you, like, go into it at, at first? Yeah, I mean, I got excited about it when, you know, when I met that, met that puppeteer that I was talking about, um, and then I just start, uh, started making stuff, started making very rudimentary puppets, um, you know, like most, pup like there's actors who act in other people's plays. There are puppeteers who just puppeteer and don't build puppets, but most people um, are interested in, in building their own puppets. So I would just say start, start making and start playing. And, and if you can find, uh, I know that there are lots of puppet people in Detroit too. If you can like, you know, go work with some people, try to be in a show, try to co help, help out in someone's studio. Uh, yeah. Right, perfect, thank you so yeah. much. Hi, um, I wanted to ask um, if you have like a favorite moment or a moment that sticks out to you that you that happened to you during like the process of making all of your projects. A moment of discovery. Mm. Oh man, Those are some good ones. Well, I mean, like, I really enjoyed, you know, like I said, I made all this cardboard stuff and I, like, enjoyed the limitation of the material, being like, it's just cardboard, you can just do these things. Um, realizing that I could transfer that over to plastic bags, um, uh, that was very fun, too. So it, was, it was a totally different material. It doesn't do the same thing cardboard does, it does a whole other thing. Um, but, but realizing how much I, like, need those limitations a little bit and how that, like, how being locked into these materials or themes actually really like freed my mind. Yeah. Hi, so I just have a more practical question. I'm just curious how you set your time up. Do you like do something artistic every day? Do you go on these binges where you're 24 seven, you know, kind of, and maybe how that's changed in your career and you know, so, yeah, that's a good question, how I manage my time. Um, I Poorly, sometimes. <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, you know, I would definitely go on binges, uh, and, and early on, more, you know, in the creating Fitz Cardboard Aldo and, and the pigeoning, you know, I was like, 
bartending at night and then just making art all day um, and probably not in like the healthiest way because I didn't really have a good, I just would, I was just so hungry and I just was really trying to make something good um, and I, I would get very obsessive and, and kind of stressed out. I'm a, a little bit more chill about it now, but I do, I try to keep like business hours, mm -hmm. you know, for the most part and that really helped me once I learned that I should have that kind of structure. Yeah, but I mean, I, I try to go to the studio every day in, in that way, but oftentimes in the studio, my boyfriend and I always have this joke where we like imagine that we're in the, like we always think the stu you should be in the studio like splashing paint on the walls and like and you're, you're being so creative, but really you're just like answering emails most of the time. <laughs> well, thank you, this was yeah. very cool, really enjoyed yeah. it, thank you. Yeah. Hi, um, I, right, I noticed at the beginning, like during the introduction, that it, when someone mentioned that you got like donations from like the Jim Henson Foundation, like I'm a big Muppets fan for some reason, they're great. Would you say like when you started getting into puppetry, like did you look to that kind of a lens through it or did you look more towards other things that were less popular in, the, in like that culture? Yeah, I mean, of course I like grew up on the Muppets and loved that stuff. I mean, everyone loves that, so, so good, yeah. Um, but I think I, I think I got more, more turned on about some of the weirder stuff, you know? A lot of like the Brothers Quay animations and weird Czech marionettes and stuff like that. Um, but the Henson Foundation gives uh, grants to all different kinds of puppetry work. So, and that's been really helpful. Awesome, yeah. thank you. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, I had a couple quick questions. I was wondering what the name of the Seattle puppet troupe was called again, and then also for making like your cardboard cities and stuff like that, if there's any other materials that you use or like your process to know like when they're done because like from the pictures they look very beautifully crafted and like finished and not like when you just try to make a fort out of cardboard. So I was wondering what your process of materials for that were. Yeah. Um well, cardboard is the best one because it's free and recyclable and <laughs> and so easy to use and so easy to get. Um, and when I know I'm done I, is when I've run out of time. You know, I, I, I just kind of keep taking things farther and farther and farther. Um, and I keep getting, like I'm getting, like when I'm making this new cardboard film, I'm not getting faster, I'm getting slower, but I'm like getting deeper. <laughs> <laughs> which is a little scarier, a little more detailed every single time. And so for me, like, it's, I just kind of, I, I keep going until, until the show opens. <laughs> it's a little obsessive and probably not the healthiest advice, but yeah. The Seattle Puppet. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, they were called the Jawbone Puppet Theater, and that artist, his name is Adam Ende, and he's still a friend of mine, and he has, he's still a puppeteer, and he has a, a fun, wacky puppet festival in, in Vashon Island in Seattle. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Um, my question is just what was one of the more difficult um, puppetry mechanics and um, that seemed impossible at first and what did you do to get the result you wanted? Oh, difficult puppetry mechanics. Um, well, I think in the beginning I used to like have visions of like wanting to design very complicated mechanism-y kind of puppet stuff. I really like nerded out on that but then I often realized that it was, it, it was better to have the h humans gesture it. Like when we, you can see we're using our hands like over Frank's hands to grab stuff. When I first made Frank, I had like magnets in his hand and magnets in all the other stuff and I'm trying to have him like pick up the phone and it, the magnets were getting stuck to everything. And I was like, actually, it's better if you just see the puppeteer, you know? I think that you, you know, there's like this balance in puppetry between like, mechanics and performance and I think it, they kind of it's I tend to err on performance because people are forgiving you know when they see the puppeteer they like kind of like to be able to see that so I haven't done anything that's too technically very difficult um, I try to rely more on what the performer can do thank you, thank yeah. you so much yeah 
I think it's super cool that you got a storefront on uh, Times Square for the plastic bag store. And I, I'm super inspired by using uh, like meeting places as canvases for art. And I'm wondering if you think that there's some kind of ethical limit to the weirdness that you can put in a public space. No, no. Lovely. <laughs> Hi, um, I really admire your use of humor and like storytelling. I was just wondering, like coming from an art standpoint, how you kind of grew into more of like a, like a filmmaker, writer kind of storyteller. How I became more, more of a storyteller? Yeah. So, yeah. Gosh, I don't know, you know, it's, um, it's kind of just evolved, you know. Um, you know, a lot of the stories, you know, I had the big, I had the structure for them or the ideas and a lot of it came out of joking around with, the other puppeteers, we would brainstorm together. Once we kind of knew the character, we could know um, what he does. But I don't. I tend to not like sit down and write plays. I, I have to. I'll get like an image or an idea, and then I'll start making. So a lot of my writing process is making something that I see, and then while I'm hot gluing, my mind will wander, and I'll start piecing together connections. I feel m more like a detective. Uh, with like a pin board and string than I do like a writer at a typewriter. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Hi, um, I was very fascinated by the work you were doing with plastic archeology span and I was wondering if you could speak more to um, what you learned from the archeology span department, uh, specifically how you, uh, the assignment or the reassignment of meaning to familiar objects that are kind of like semantically rooted in our brains. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I have, like, can really articulate what I want to say about, about that, but I have a lot of feelings and thoughts about it. It was very fun to, because when we made the Museum of the Most Valued Customer, I mean, we had all these plastic trash, and then we had to sit down, and it was mostly me and, and Tyler and, and, and Admiral and some of the other collaborators would sit and look at these objects and try to imagine we didn't know what they looked like or what they were, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I, that was like a very, a very helpful, I, I, in all kinds of aspects of life, you know? There's some things that you just take for granted that just become a part of the landscape, but to try to look at things like, like an alien, um, uh, yeah, it gives you a whole new, there's a really great book called The Motel of Mysteries, highly recommend it. It's a, um, someone recommended to me when I was writing the show and it's about, archaeologists who've discovered this motel and they're just like completely getting everything wrong as well <laughs> yeah um but yeah very fun to you know because we apply meanings to these things they don't have them you know it's just stuff it's just atoms <laughs> so it's fun to apply new meetings to them as well thank you very much yeah uh, uh, first off that was great that's probably one of the, like the best things i've seen like in a while thank you uh, I had, <laughs> my question was about like humor specifically, cause I know you touched on that like a little bit and how that kind of played a role and like your creativity and whatnot. I guess I was just kind of wondering, well, two things. You ever considered doing like comedy or anything like that? Like in the past? I would, I would love to. I okay. wish, that's in my alternate life. I'm on Saturday Night Live. Okay, makes sense, <laughs> makes sense. Um, and then I guess on, on a bit more of a serious note, I was wondering if like with the creative process, do you kind of make it a point to like step at it in like a, like a comedic sense? Like do you like start from a point of like, oh, because I noticed a couple of times you said something about like, oh, like, I thought this was funny or I just thought this was like ridiculous and I think like those kind of coincide with each other. Like, yeah, I, I think, I mean, I'm, I was raised by funny people, which helps. Um, and I think that we shouldn't take ourselves so seriously because the world is a pretty ridiculous place and there's some like relief in that for me. Like it feels better in my body to be able to laugh at things instead of take things so seriously. Um, it allows me to have a more like limber, like response to things. And, um, and you know, it's also, humor is kind of like, it's kind of radical in a way, you know, like, cause all these institutions have to take them so, so serious, so self, so seriously. Right. But to laugh at them is like, just, you know, like you're not supposed to laugh in church, you know, why? <laughs> it's like, it's like, it's kind of like, 
um, it's, it's liberating and it's freeing. Um, and I think it's also a, a way to let the audience trust me a little bit more, yeah. to be like, I'm not gonna like drag you over the coals, I'm gonna like show you a good time, you know, Makes and sense. like sneak in little ideas here and there. Well, it definitely works. Oh, thanks man, <laughs> come to the show. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Hi, um, I have a question about like, so you, you have like a very strong narrative in like your stories and stuff. So I was wondering what, pushes that narrative and how do you stay motivated to keep to it without like losing that motivation throughout the films? Mm. Uh, well, like with the, you know, that's a good question. I'm not exactly sure how to answer that. I want to answer it with like a politician and divert to something else, but I'm going to not do that. I'm going to stick with my narrative question. <laughs> um, <clears throat> how do I stick with the narrative? Uh, often I, I kind of like envision this structure of the narrative or the sketch first, so I know where it begins and I know where it needs to end. And, and then it's easier for me to like fill in the things that happen in between, more so than like keep writing a story and be like, and then what happens, and then what happens, and then what happens. So um, I kind of am already in these, in these bounds. Um, and then keeping things in certain themes or in certain time period, like the pigeoning, it was like, oh, it's only 80s office equipment. Then it was like, okay, well now he's got a Polaroid camera and he's taking pictures. Okay, now he's got a slide projector. It was like, again, that thing about limitations somehow offering all this like freedom instead of just being like, anything could happen to Frank. He could do anything in the next scene. It's like, no, he has to do investigation stuff with 80s technology. <laughs> so um, having those boundaries actually helps. Hope that worked. Was that an answer? Yep, okay. thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, my question is, when you have a new medium or a new skill that you want to learn, how do you go about, like, what are the first steps that you take mm -hmm. to do that? Uh, I do watch a lot of YouTube videos. I renovated a house watching YouTube. <laughs> um, and working for people who know wh what they're doing really helps. Um, I, I've, I've gotten to work for, I worked for many artists before I was an artist and, 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 and watched, watched how they do it. Um, yeah, I think that's probably the best answer I could get. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Hi, so I also really love puppets and miniatures and really loved your uh, Fitz Cardboard Aldo. Um, and I feel like in my own work, I kind of deal with like a lack of confidence. And I'm curious how you go about um, getting people um, involved in your process as well as securing funding and also seeking out those artist residencies. Mm, yeah, well, keeping people involved, in, uh, getting people to help uh, snacks, provide snacks, <laughs> beer, provide beer. <laughs> uh, I try to make it a fun process for people to be involved in, and I hope that I also, you know, I want the, their input and their, I want them to have ownership over it as well and to feel like it's creative and fulfilling for them as well instead of just like extra hands and limbs, you know, to help, to assist me. Um, and, you know, securing funding and, and, and residencies, it's just like applying for stuff is just, it's, you just gotta always be applying for stuff and you gotta be reapplying for stuff and you just gotta not get too attached to the results and just think about it as part of your, part of your job. Um, and, you know, I've, I've been rejected by more things than I've gotten and um, you can't take it personally. Uh, it's just because it's a different panel of people every single time and every single time you apply to something, a panel of professionals is being exposed to your work. So it's advertising in a way. And it also helps you become a better writer and a better communicator about your work, which is really important. Um, and it's like a very important skill to develop and it sucks. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Hi, um, I was gonna kind of ask what Ed just asked, but like, um, I'm like about to graduate and I'm like also someone who like loves like big installation and like lover of garbage and like the great thing about garbage is like it's free but also like how do you like get like a like a studio like I am also someone who's like I'm gonna just like make stuff out of garbage in my room but then like my room is full of garbage and like 
like, how do you even go about, like, well, finding a secondary place? Yeah, I mean, that's a process. I mean, I, I had, like, a live-work situation. I lived in a warehouse in New York for many years, and so I, I had some extra space. Um, um, but I made do. There's also, uh, you know, there are a lot of cities that offer, like, subsidized um, studio space, and temporary residencies is also super, super helpful. Um, but yeah, it, it, it is a process, for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Um, I just have another question, also because um, graduating senior, and I know you talked about how you didn't start, um, like, the cardboard, like, the pieces you showed, like, until you, you were in your 30s. Yeah. I was just wondering if you could, like, recap a bit, like, what you did post-grad, because I know you said you yeah. studied painting and then did, like, assistant jobs with artists. Yeah. I'm just wondering if you could explain your journey and how you, like, made money and survived. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I bartended for 11 years, um, and I lived in San Francisco in a community of artists. I worked for other artists. Um, and that, I was lucky enough to work with an artist named Swoon. Um, and um, she was a, a street artist, but she, she did a project for several years where she built junk rafts and traveled down various rivers. And so I got to help her with that. So in my 20s, I was like kind of all over the place. And you should go do wild, big, crazy adventures that you won't be able to do later. <laughs> Don't worry too much about getting so much work done. Because I didn't even really know like what I had to say, or you know, I kind of had to be like exposed to a bunch of stuff as well. Um, but but another thing is also that um, I will say that Tyler, who um, you saw in those videos, and who is in my show now, and who is the greedy peasant on TikTok, uh, <laughs> I'll keep saying that because some people know. Uh, <laughs> he um, he, I taught a class at, at the University of uh, Maryland briefly, and he was my student, and he graduated, and he moved to New York, and he, he just called me, and he asked if he could come to my studio if, and say hi, and he did, and I had just started this project, and I was like, oh, well, actually, maybe I really could use some help, and he worked for me for many years, and now he's the star of this show, and he has his own show, and so it's like... If, being proactive and seeking out people who you would want to work with or want to help or want to learn from, um, because you never really know what that'll turn into. Yeah. Robin, I hate to be the bearer of the time clock, but um, we do have to clear the theater now, folks, because oh, we, we have just one Michigan. more, one more real quick. You can, you guys can go to the side and do that. I okay. just, they have another film. That, oh, yeah, there's yeah. other things that happen in this theater. Thank you so much, you guys. After us. Really Thanks sweet. everybody for coming. You can ask her, but.